Yeah, I think I, I, I'm getting to it. Did Magnus? Just if you need the support or. Thank you. Um, was it on? Yeah. I can't really talk about it. Now. I can't, don't have my glasses on. On oh, mute, good. Hello, hello. That's not working. <laughs> Hello everyone, good morning and welcome back to day two of the hub. Um, today we will have some very special presentations by Brooke, Garu, Andrew, Aki Thami and Tanzim Wahab. Uh, and um, our, the most important part of the hub, the panel discussion at the end of it where we will have collective conversations and it will be a round table like seating where we ask everybody to come together and uh, we'll open up for conversations and uh, this is yeah one of my favorite parts of the hub where there'll be free-flowing um, dialogue and we really encourage you to participate um, there's been great questions yesterday so we ask you to keep that going um, so I want to run over the day's flow of events once more please um, and the house rules so uh, firstly, uh, do not enter or leave the venue during the presentations as it disturbs the presenter. We will adhere to the schedule when the breaks are mentioned in between. And I request you to please wait for those breaks before you uh, leave or enter the room. All presentations, as you saw yesterday, are around 30 minutes with 30 minutes of dialogues after that. And we request you to save your questions until after the presentation. And um, photography and videography is permitted, but we ask you to refrain from using flash. Uh, we have water bottles available, so if you brought your own bottles, feel free to refill them. And we also have glasses available for water bottles. And um, please keep your mobile phones on silent mode or switched off at all times, especially during the presentations. I wanted to make a special mention that we have Bani Abidi's monograph, The Artist Who, available outside, should you like a copy. We also have copies of other artists' books and our annual books for purchase as well. Um, even if you would like to browse, please feel free to go outside during the break and have a look at them. And thank you again for being with us today, and I hand over the mic to Natasha. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Vidhi. On day two, um, I usually do a quick roundup of um, all of the uh, knowledge that has been uh, shared in the room and circulated through um, formal and informal conversations. Uh, so, uh, yeah, welcome to everyone who is joining today and uh, also uh, to those of you who are continuing to stay with us. You might remember some of these uh, moments. We started uh, the day, first day of the Curators Hub with Cabello Malazzi, who opened um, in this vivid way, connecting one's birth year um, to local and global event horizons. In hearing um, Sister Roberta Thab and Aretha Franklin serenades, we thought of them as sort of sonic formations arriving amidst us um, and how those compose a practice of being in the world. She also stressed how choral music plays a role in anti-colonial, anti-apartheid lineage, what it means when one comes from a matrilineal upbringing and the wisdom of grandmothers as an oasis of self-knowledge. This was also something that was mentioned with Hitman and Shalesha what it means not to speak an official language and the usefulness of transla mistranslation um, or the continued presence of it in one's life and practice. What that does in terms of creating or composing a friction of emotions. She also brought in a um, quote from Kojo Ashun, um, whose writing is uh, phenomenal as an artist and thinker, what it means to be listening to oneself listening, what kind of feedback and reverb that might produce as we, as we conduct um, that exercise amidst us in listening to ourselves and listening collectively. 
what inheritance one carries into an institution as she takes up her role at Constala Bern in recent months, and what are the ways of creative accounting, if we might call it that, which challenge institutional presumptions and methods. And how she reminded us, I think towards the end, I don't know, Kabbalah, if this is you or who else said it, um, that curators and art historians are not the most risk-taking humans. And I thought, that's a, that's a good takeaway. Um, Shalesha Rajbandari and Hetman Gurung brought to us thorough worldviews and acts of representation that include matrilineal and spiritual wisdoms, but also political agency and ways that that is being released in their work and in their communities. People of, of this generation really taking on that mantle and what it means to support each other shoulder to shoulder in the streets and in studios and through exhibitions such as the Kathmandu Triennale with Cosman Costinas um, and also their important work in Venice uh, bringing artists from Nepal uh, to that forum. They've also enabled working with indigenous practices that inform history telling differently, that contextualize their worlds in Nepal, that foreground displacement and surveillance, the prevalence of militarization in the aftermath of the People's War. Hitman and Chilesha's artistic work also takes into consideration the role of migrant labor and what that means back in the village the kinds of um, dispossessions, but also the ways in which people's traditions can be sustained and the ways that ancestral livelihoods can enter in and out of artistic spaces. That said, they also ask us to acknowledge from this place where we are sitting, Calcutta, India, our lack of knowledge on the historical intricacies and flawed representations of their region. They ask, what becomes public? And let us contest publicness. Let us think what needs to remain private and protected. And what it also means to build kinships that move beyond the time scale of a temporary exhibition. In this, they and others who have been with us hold together a world of practices without cynicism. We're thinking about regeneration together. This comes also with Ruang Rupa, whose early projects since 2000 emerge from the space of the home. And the ways that the home can be mapped and used, such as it becomes a multi-purpose site of conviviality, how that very home then translates into different formations of, of exhibitions, of schools, um, of radical acts of togetherness how an organization is a living space within a neighborhood. And Ade informed us as well of how in Jakarta, the urban and rural imagination reside in conversation. Then how after many years of their work together, ideas of the interlocal may be carried to Kassel with all of the challenges, all of the criticisms, and all of the repeated attempts that it's taken for all of those collectives to reside there and make their presence felt. They also elaborated on the concept of Lumbung and Lumbung values at work in Majlis, the, their form of assembly and, and collective decision making. They informed us of what it means to make a collective pot, which is a site of redistribution, trying to think differently about uh, what a large budget means and what it might break down to, the core components. Um, again, that's something that would be great to kind of talk more about. Um, but it did, I think, at least um, make me think about how surplus and sufficiency may be redefined in our midst. Their approach to non-crong or hanging out as part of um, residing together within an exhibition like Documenta, um, taking uh, not only the front entrance, but really thinking a lot about the back entrance um, and other ways of inhabiting these architectures of institutions. What it means to treat a, sp a space like the Frutizianum um, in Kassel, uh, not as a center, but rather really, um, again, a, a sort of space where artist-led pedagogic approaches, libraries of solidarity, and community archives can be presented 
without the restrictive codifications and hierarchies that we often, uh, that we often need um, when exhibitions are formalized in certain ways uh, through artists-run spaces and collectives. There was a sense of building resonance and synergies within those spaces of music, rest, games, childcare, cinema, publishing, and gardening, such that it was never assumed that this was an exhibition to be looked at. Ashok Sukumaran um, brought to, from camp, um, and important to say, China has been with us and um, also brought in just such incredible thinking from the practice, I think. For us, it was also a way of continuing um, the conversation with, with them. Uh, but Ashok particularly brought in a taste of digital sensoria, um, thinking critically through the layers of media in the room and data harvesting, where we are at with notions of infinite transferability, um, how we need to rethink those uh, kinds of uh, modes of um, distribution within what is happening with AI, even though I acknowledge fully this conversation was not about AI, it was more about the kind of infrastructures and mediascapes and um, possibilities of sort of constantly reimagining and doing the, the hard <laughs> behind the scenes programming of like what it means to actually build and sustain those spaces. What it means to sense the vertical and not taking the labor behind creating and, and maintaining web archives, indexing and circulating infrastructures um, in the way that they do and what they do to make it available to all of us or those of us who want to access it. Um, also, um, Ashok put forward whether data is the new oil of the 21st century. It's a question, um, but it's also the kind of thing that circulates in terms of us thinking about what actually is happening with um, the data that leaks through every time that we um, sign on, we're always sign on, we're always plugged in. So yeah, the multiple leaks, I guess, um, of ourselves and our inscribed um, spaces of, of knowing and living. And I think this, this way of really thinking with CAMP um, brought in that back end of the studio and the broader alliances of the practice. So thank you for that. Uh, Karuna Nandi, um, our uh, guest uh, lecturer, Supreme Court advocate, a human rights lawyer, brought to us what it means to take on enduring cases of mass toxicity, state failures, and corporate greed, such as um, evidenced multiple occasions, but also within the Bhopal gas disaster and waste dumps. What it means, um, to me, that really struck me as the fact of that I was born in 1985, Bhopal happened one year before, and it felt like this case has this knowledge of this toxicity has accompanied one for one's lifetime. That's kind of crazy, and it, just the way she talked about representing that case made me realize that. And it felt quite profound uh, somehow. Um, what art has to do or not with the upholding of a social contract and constitutional values. Again, what it means to, um, again, critically reflect on the, on, that, on the making of that constitution. So, I acknowledge also the question that came um, on the role of Ambedkar. What are the ways in which artistic readings and offerings of testimony inhabit the world and rub against notions of official evidence, knowing that laws and sites of justice production, truth-telling, have existed for as long as human beings have lived together and claimed kinship? It is only a certain formation of legal systems within the nation state and international arbitration that form and offer a perspective um, of a certain kind of idea of the law and of legal infrastructure. But as we know, justice production and justice as medium is something that slips through the cracks and is constantly awaited. So I want to acknowledge that as well. Um, but Karuna is someone who we do um, respect for her continued attempts to wrestle with the legal system, and particularly one of her uh, other cases, longstanding uh, now, um, is to challenge sedation and def uh, defamation as have been placed into the colonial uh, system, 
and through that into our the way that legal uh, codes shape our uh, uh, limit our means of expression and what it means for her then to try to salvage press freedom in this country. We ended the day with um, going to Bani Abidi's exhibition, the song, um, and express gratitude to Sabika Abbas Nakwi um, for her poetry, uh, her renditions of Matam. Um, I'm really particularly uh, thinking deeply about um, the role of lament in our times um, as fierce remembering, as poetical overflows, as quantum defiance, and as women's legacies of acoustic refuge. With that, <laughs> I wrote that all this morning. Um, I would love to... Uh, <laughs> I would love for us to hear a track, music, by um, a dear friend, musician Sarthi Korwar uh, and Zia Ahmed. this land, there is a green mark on it, mi casa es su casa, says the man who stole your land, mi casa es su casa, says the man who sold your land, is this tattoo henna or ink, does it fade? Who remembers all of the patterns you've made? Let's not talk about race. Let's not talk about class. Let's not talk about faith. Let's not talk about caste. Is a crack from the trout that attacked. Blood is thicker than water. Oil is thicker than blood. Water's quicker than both. And when you're hit with a flood, you'll get caught in the mud and you won't be able to run. Does the ice stitch itself back together? Does the forest stitch itself back together? Does the land stitch itself back together? Do people stitch themselves back together?
did it get so deep? Higher and higher, water and fire. 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 Thank you for indulging and enjoying it. Um, welcome to Brooke Andrew, um, our first speaker for today. Um, artist, curator, scholar, who is, I love this bias, I'm just like gonna partly read through the first um, half and then uh, riff <laughs> on, yeah, Brooke's greatness. Um, who is Thank driven you. by the collisions of intertwined narratives, often emerging from the mess of the colonial whole. Uh, his interdisciplinary practice harnesses alternative narratives to explore the legacies of colonization and modernism. Through his artworks, museum interventions, and curatorial projects, he challenges the limitations imposed by power structures, historical amnesia, stereotyping, and complicity to center indigenous perspectives. Brooke's work in that sense is also a way to think through power objects, um, to think through and work through the archive and what has been left out of it, together with artists, communities, and various public and private collections. He has been the artistic director of NIRIN, the 22nd Biennial of Sydney, and recently we have worked as co-curators on Yoi Care Repair Healing, um, that is ongoing at the Gropius Bau in Berlin. He was also international advisor to the Nordic Pavilion, being transformed into the Sami Pavilion at the 59th International um, Exhibition in Venice. Um, and he is, uh, has taught for many years um, in universities in Australia, but is currently the director of Reimagining Museums and Collections and enterprise professor in interdisciplinary practice at the University of Melbourne. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, um, I presume this is on. Yes, you can all hear me. Yama, everyone. Uh, Yama is uh, Wiradjuri or Wiradjuri, the anglicized version. It's my mother's language group. Um, Wiradjuri or Wiradjuri is one of about 300 different um, indigenous Aboriginal nations of Australia. So like many indigenous nations of the world, we are many and we have many languages. And um, we were talking about actually linguicide yesterday and the kind of extraordinary um, linguicide and invisibility that a lot of us hold and a lot of these trauma spaces that we're often in, not only as kind of heteronormative, kind of controlled, colonized moments, uh, which does not allow for um, you know, a queering or differentiation of who we are, the kind of multiple identities that we are, um, that coming back to language, it's so important to, for us to identify who we are. And as we all know, language holds power. It holds representation. It holds um, the way in which that we view and understand the world. And if we deny people language, if we deny people the way in which that we communicate to each other, if we don't learn even just another piece of someone else's language, for me, I find that it's in some ways a further disconnection. Um, so I, I acknowledge my ancestors of my Wiradjuri and also my Ngunnawal. I say Ngunnawal because I come from a matriarchal community. And my father is Celtic. Um, and I just wanted to share some of my, my language here. Um, Yama is hi. It just means I see you. So, um, it's a it's a it's a uh, it's a, a formal way of seeing you and, and acknowledging you, and um, and Bandangu for um, thank you for Experimenta and all of the incredible work that you have all done as a team over all these years, and to Natasha of course and all of you being here today and I know that some of you have come for a long time, but I also want to uh, acknowledge Madam Gidyal, which means healing, and I think that it's so important for us to come here to kind of think about these spaces also in healing, because within trauma spaces there's also a need for healing. And, and often we don't um, see eye to eye on that or we don't understand what that means and hence what I call the mess of colonization. Um, so 
Garu is my middle name. Um, it's, it's the magpie, so my grandmother gave me the name of, of the magpie. My son's name is Mabi, which is like this little possum creature. And the Kalamide is the land of the three rivers. So there's three rivers which go through um, uh, the Wiradjuri lands. And I pay my respects to all of the elders here tonight and all of those people who are from these lands and to all my indigenous family here today. <laughs> Clicking, here we go. I just want to, um, I, I will, um, I, I'd like to tell stories in my presentations, um, you know, uh, and I think that I want to start really with sharing, continuing to share language. Um, so where I come from, my grandmother was um, brought up on an Aboriginal mission. You've probably heard about these reserves or missions. I mean, really, there were concentration camps. We had apartheid in Australia. We had laws around segregation and then around assimilation. So the kind of same apartheid laws, you probably um, quite familiar with South Africa, for example, or even here. You would probably call them other words. Um, so the darker skinned you were uh, in, in up to a certain period, you couldn't go to swimming pools, you couldn't go to the cinema, etc. And they changed the law to assimilation because they realised that when people started having fair-skinned children like myself, um, we didn't really assimilate. We still spoke about our culture, um, etc. And so uh, it's a, a complex history, but I just wanted to kind of mention this because um, language is a very important aspect of how we live in the world today. Um, I'm sure Alicia Hipman and Natasha and I were in the car this morning reflecting on teaching. What is teaching? Is this teaching? Yes, this is teaching. You know, and, or if we look at institutional way of teaching, but what do we call this? And then it reminds me of, of the word decolonial, which is a very kind of active word internationally. I think it's a very complicated word. It means very different things to different people from different places with different experiences. And there is no level playing field that I can find myself within that. And so I decided to use the word Yindyamara, Wanangana. And Yindyamara is a Wiradjuri way of li living life respectfully and gently and with care. Because for me, the, the so-called decolonial process that's happening in colonised or, or kind of the so-called centres of, of the world are often really helping those cultures to understand their own historical disaster and the mess that they find themselves in and then we end up unpacking that for them and then we fall to the side. And so I didn't want myself or my culture or my language to be part of the decolonial process. I wanted it to be in Jamata because you don't just decolonize a museum and then you get on with it. You don't like, oh, there's a group of people there. We're going to make them happy. We're going to give a few things back. Thank you very much for your words. We're going to give you 500 bucks. Off you go. That's not care. That's not Madam Gidil. In Jamar, it's ongoing. It needs to be ongoing. It just doesn't stop for me and, and, and what I believe in. And also my, my community and my friends. Um, Niren. So I'm going to uh, really continue this kind of storytelling. Niren is the 22nd Biennale of Sydney. It happened in 2020. And some of my friends here were in there or kind of knew about the, the exhibition. Um, and for me, as a, a creative person, um, just swimming in the world. Uh, when I was approached to do the, the Biennale, I was like, why? Like, why do they want me to do this for? <laughs> you know, like, what, what is a Biennale? I've always, I'm, I'm very critical of Biennales. For me, they are the legacies of the great colonial exhibitions. You know, not only in Paris, not only in Sydney, not only in Delhi, not only in Madrid, you know, they are in London. They're like, we all inherit these colonial spaces that are incredibly vibrant historically, but incredibly devastating and have huge effects on who we are as, as not just indigenous peoples, but who we are in the world today. And it's these kind of legacies, I think, that um, still are still embedded within the way in which that the Venice Biennale, for example, or other Biennales are actually <coughs> promoted, are provided. Um, 
so when I thought about, okay, you know, got together with a group of people, um, many, many, too many people to, to kind of mention now, but of course Megan Tamita Cornell and Anana Bush, you know, some other very familiar names, to really reflect on, okay, what is this in your Biennale going to be? So I wanted it to be a Wiradjuri word. I wanted all the different edges of the world, the so-called, you know, margins that, you know, not only, in, you know, indigenous peoples, but other peoples who are not necessarily caught within, um, you know, the so-called centre of, of what art is. How is it that we can feel Madam Gidyal healing or safe, but also rejoice? You know, how is it that we can be brought together? And... There's no pressure to travel either. I mean, I think that often with contemporary art exhibitions, there's this pressure to leave your community or to leave your family or to be mentally kind of available or kind of emotionally available. These are very unsafe places sometimes to be and not everyone has the capacity to do this. And yet uh, there is this kind of obligation um, within a kind of a dominant narrative or how, how it is that we're in these visual arts kind of spaces or creative spaces. So I think it's really important to acknowledge who you are as individuals, to say, I don't want to do that. It's okay, but I want to do it this way. And it's not perfect. I'm not saying Niran was perfect. I think that Ron Grupa were talking about this, like lots of us were talking about what are these spaces, and that Natasha and I, like did, doing Yoi, Carapel and Heal, very long process of how we work together about creating an exhibition of care, or, you know, but also rejoicing these spaces. They're never perfect. But I think the consciousness around them was um, something that I really wanted to collaborate with. And so these are all Wiradjuri words, um, and often, uh, our words have many different meanings. So Madam Gidjil is one way of, heal, of, of talking about really personal healing. Um, and Bagarai Bang is um, all, everyone healing together. And I know that, you know, you, um, Cabela was talking about, uh, you know, gardening, etc. So, you know, we had, you know, uh, creatives who, um, you know, worked with, foods and, you know, making food, preparing food, foraging, you know, all of these kind of other spaces, which I think are just really, really great. The other thing uh, about doing biennales or exhibitions are catalogues. And um, when I first joined the biennale, um, so well, okay, you know, you may not get a catalogue um, because it depends on the funding. We all know how these things roll. And it's like we're under hostage. We're constantly under hostage around this kind of space. And so I said, fine, that's going to be an artist project. As soon as it becomes an artist project, they can't take it away from you. And so there's two. There's a catalogue. And if anyone's interested in, you know, getting hold of some of these, I know that, like, there aren't many left, but I could send some to Experimenter, et cetera, for some in my studio. Um, because, of course, the, the Biennale of Sydney pulped them all. They didn't call me and say, hey, Brooke, we've got 20 boxes of catalogues here. Do you want them? Do you want to give them out to the artists or the communities or whatever? So, like, really bad decisions are often made, right, within these kind of spaces. Um, and then we said so there were two. There was a, a kind of a catalogue, and then there was this um, near and nay, so nay, as it means to see. Um, and we worked uh, with many different artists, also artists who were not in, kind of officially in the Biennale as well. Um, and we worked with Takalik Partridge, who's um, Inuit from North Canada. And talk, coming back to language, we spoke with her about using Inuktitut. So Inuktitut is her language. And this is her language here. So we used her um, syllabus, uh, syllable as, um, as like the markers to go to, to each page. So it wasn't like a linear. It wasn't like page one, page two, page three. So it was this kind of different way of kind of learning, um, you know, through the mind of, of, of somebody else. And this is, <laughs> I love this photo. It's so mechanical and old and clunky. This is Stuart Geddes on the left and Trent Walter on the right. Trent Walter um, uh, is Celtic um, Sri Lankan. And um, Stuart is, is, I think, German um, Celtic Australian. And they worked on both publications. So we handed it to them. They got this old Heidelberg machine. They worked with artists internationally. They're always working with artists. So even from that, it was kind of like, OK, how is it that we can kind of embed kind of artists or creatives or communities into these processes? And um, you can actually look at this online. It doesn't have all the artist pages from the Niran Ney catalogue, but you just go to Niran-Ney, 
and gway.net, and, and you'll have um, you can read and dip and dip out of these of these pages. So the typical Biennale, you know, you have your venues, you have your welcome speeches, you have politicians talking for a really long time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, where are the artists? Where are the communities? Where are the creatives? So right from the beginning, um, uh, it was kind of like the 101 of <laughs> uh, how things are going to roll. And so it's very much centred indigenous uh, protocols and methodologies. And so there was always a welcome to country by, by local traditional owners um, throughout Sydney. And Uncle Madden is there somewhere, Alan Madden there. I think he's about to come on. Um, and this is the didgeridoo, or the yadaki. You might see that instrument. It's quite a well-known um, indigenous instrument from the top of Australia. So what the first kind of protocols that we really embedded within how we well, you know, wanted to kind of produce, I suppose, the Biennale, is that artists and tradition, well, traditional owners speak first, and then artists speak second, and then, you know, any politicians or museum directors have to speak last. Um, and it, this was not a political move. It wasn't like a, you know, it wasn't doing this to kind of create, like, you know, tension. It was just through our own methodologies of how we wanted to do this. And, of course, you know, the parties that came together, if they decided to reorient it, no, they can reorient it. But, you know, they just kind of, you know, just kind of needed to, to support people the way in which that they wanted to do, do that process. Um, and this also happened inside. This is Emily Karaka, who's a senior Māori, um, artist from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Incredible, incredible, incredible painter, but also a very important leading um, land rights activist. So it was really kind of like handing over and supporting the kind of ways in which that they wanted to kind of work. And um, you'll see the, the, the big photograph behind here. That's of Barbara McGrady, Auntie Barbara McGrady, who's a Gamilaroi woman from Western New South Wales, west of Sydney. And um, so they're her photographs, these banners. Is this a pointer? Yes. These banners here um, are from the late um, Mr. Williams, who passed away just before um, you know, the Biennale opened. But his wife, Tuppy, is here um, from the Western Desert. And here's another view. Oh, there's Barbara there. I have a little red, black, and yellow Aboriginal hat on. These are all um, Mr. Williams' language. It's Pitinjara language. Um, it's very similar to Yunkanjara um, uh, language, which is the, known as the M MPY lands um, and the Naratjara lands. Um, and we worked, and these are all uh, statements around land rights and how to achieve land rights. Um, I actually thought that I had another image about this, but I will come back to it. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through all this. So this is Tony Albert's work on Cockatoo Island. It's an island space where she, <laughs> Archie Nepal also exhibited. Look at this silly shoes. <laughs> and this is the welcome to country and opening of the Cockatoo Island space. Um, and Tony Albert's work, who's a local Indigenous Australian artist, um, created this work where um, people would come and write a note and plant it at the bottom of a tree, and these trees would be going out to repopulate indigenous lands, um, and you could write your own little personal note. So it's really about, again, Madam Gidya, like healing the land. Um, we have here um, Gina Athena Ulysses, um, born in Haiti, but now lives in the US, who gave incredible, um, my God, this is at the Museum of Contemporary Art. I have to give a set of context for this. Imagine going to an opening. The opening is at 6 p.m. The performances went for about 45 minutes. Like, Gina was relentless. She was, you know, her poetry and prose is basically talking about the, tra you know, the transatlantic slave trade. And then we had um, Pedro Winamira, who came on, um, who's from the Tiwi Islands. And he also did, you know, a very incredible performance uh, of his traditional songs. And then uh, the, the director of the time, Lizanne McGregor, came on after 45 minutes and said, I'm sorry, we don't have time for any other speeches. <laughs> so it was this incredible moment. Um, before I talk about the Colleen and Bry, um community, I'm just wondering, um, Joshua, 
if we could play that little song, please. So this is from uh, a community I've been working with who's next to my mother's traditional lands. This is the Gamilaroi country. And these are, this is about eight years old now, but this is a young group of kids. And I'll explain the context in a minute. Um, but I'm still working with this community. Um, and it's really about them understanding what it's like to be in like in a remote Aboriginal community where, edu you know, anyway, they talk about their experience through song. In a ball, can't stop that demon, can't see what you got. Only think about yourself forgetting about your mob. Think about the choices that you make, take control of your will. Have no shame when you play the games, screw your head on straight. Step up the play, step up the play. Wait till it's too late, wait till it's too late. Wait till it's too late, wait till it's too late. This is a story about a young Nari couple. No school, lay around, get drunk, get in the trouble. Live in the struggle, can't get out of town. No hopes, no dreams, keep keeping them down. He's only 17, got a Nari car. She's only 15, she wears a push-up bra. Mucking up at the skate park after dark. Locked up, knocked up, now broken heart. Think about the choices that you made. Take control of your will. Have no shame when you play the games. Screw your head on straight. Step up the play. Step up the play. Wait till it's too late. Wait till it's too late. Don't wait till it's too late. Don't wait till it's too late. Well, it's a hard task working it out. Mom sitting on the sideline putting you down. Now, can't you get me? You can't do that. They all said that when we were making our first rap. But look at us now, all confident and proud. Golly crew ripped it up at the hop. To the crowd, 10,000 strong. Now the whole damn world be singing along. Everybody. Think about the choices that you made. Take control of your will. Have no shame when you play the games. Screw your head on straight. Step up the play. Step up the play. Wait till it's too late. Wait till it's too late. Don't wait till it's too late. Wait till it's too late. Joshua. Um, so these young kids come from a place where, um, I'll be very quick on this, so there, there was a lot of, as we know in indigenous communities around the world, a lot of destruction. Um, the British colonisation was devastating to say the least. But in uh, 1947, which is quite recent, there was a, a, an expedition that went through Western New South Wales. And we have these important um, groups of trees um, called Mararagalani, and they're carved trees, and they're ceremonial sites. So they're churches, basically. Um, and uh, a big expedition came through from the Museum of uh, Victoria and also uh, Adelaide. And of course, these are named after the queens of England. Um, I've just realized you've got a Queen Street here. We've got a Queen Street. Um, we've got many of them. Um, and this has had a huge devastating impact on our communities, uh, you know, not only around language, but how we practice culture. We, you know, had, we couldn't practice culture for a long time. Um, these trees sections are now in museums overseas. There's one in the Pitt Reviews Museum in Oxford, two in the Ethnographic Museum in Geneva. There are trees also in Basel. Um, and it's really kind of connecting with how is it that these kids can learn about the importance of smoking ceremonies, um, uh, so this is working with Annie Rose McGregor out there. Um, she's the, one of the traditional owners and leaders. And these are the kids, uh, for the first time, really kind of engaging with these uh, carved trees. There are a few of them left on country out there. And when I went out there in 2019 um, to ask permission to show a footage of it being cut down, because to show this footage is showing, you know, it's traumatizing people. So we had to get permission um, from that community. And I think this doesn't happen enough. You know, you can't just show images that are traumatizing indigenous or other people connected to this. You have to just, you know, get permission. And if people say no, you can't say why. You just, it's just no. And so when it comes to, you know, the digital thing, you know, you can't, just because it's there, it doesn't mean it's free for everybody. Um, next one, please. It's not working now. There you go, ancestors are talking. <laughs> they want you to look at this a lot more. <laughs> 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 
Good, I'll talk about it more. And so uh, what was really important about this aspect of, the, of Niren is that then we got a 3D scan of the tree in, um, in the Pitt Reviews Museum in Oxford, and we printed that, we put that into, um, into the exhibition. Um, and this is a, a, a footage. So um, the only reason why this footage exists of bad owners, uh, as in the white landowners, because of course it was all squatting and you know stolen land. Let's not even go there. Um, she took uh, like a, a caravan holiday vacation footage of the whole thing. Now this happened to millions of other places around Australia, like from the local to the more organised. And so there's very little fo footage that actually exists. And so um, yeah, we had to get permission to show this. Um, this is just an, another one of the tree sections uh, that is from um, the Wiradjuri lands. And this is the, there's only a few left on country, of course they've been removed and put somewhere else. So this is out where the smoking ceremony happened that I just, I showed you before. Um, and this is actually my friend Brian Martin, who we're working on a big research project around the importance of Galani in Eastern Australia, big Australia Research Council um, project. That's the tree section on the right hand side. We visited the Pitt Rivers Museum recently. This is the section that's 3D printed of that. And of course this brings up things around repatriation, return of cultural objects, etc, etc. And this is a, an installation view of one of the um, sites of the Museum of Contemporary Art. And you can see that the tree section is, is in the corner over there. And the video work is up here. So it was really kind of a way to kind of engage, you know, grassroots community. It's people are just dealing with stuff everyday life. You don't have to be an artist to kind of make it an issue. Like, you know, people are like often invisible dealing with these issues, going home, struggling with death and custody, struggling with, you know, mental illness, youth suicide. You know, it's huge in our communities and it has huge impacts on us. Even when we travel overseas and we present, we kind of really have to hold ourselves together. Um, and solidarity is a very important aspect of, 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 of how we need to roll in the world. And so kind of trying to bring that in um, as much as we can. So we work with Breaking Bread and they were there like behind the scenes. You know, they were not on display. They were cooking food for people. Um, you know, this is the kind of, this is a couple of them here and like, you know, and, and with the, the Biennale crew. Um, ah, we also work with Grace and the Bee Collective, who's a Pacific Islander um, collective, and even more actually than that. And they, we got this ferry in Sydney, and they got women's um, tattoo designs and put it all over the ferry, <laughs> and it became the official Biennale <laughs> ferry. And uh, we work with local Aboriginal women, um, Marina and Julie, who are here, who did a, a walk and sm smoking ceremony to all these women, local Pacific and other women in Sydney and around Sydney and other cities who came together and celebrated and sung and danced. And this was not open to the public. This is really for the artists. It was for like community members. It was family members. And now I've just got happy snaps. So if you want to see the actual art, it's not, you're not always going to see art here. Because I think this is what I think cultural space is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about people coming together like Ahmed, Uma, um, and um, Manyaka, and all the other. Yeah. Um, so, Ri, I was talking with you, I think, yesterday. Yes? And uh, the, the ILU Collective from Central South America, they're all here. They work with art space. So where are they? So they're there, 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 there. And um, when they wanted to do this kind of collaborative, collaborative work, um, they said, very specific. We only want to work with queer people of color. That's it. And it's fine. So that's, uh, that's the volunteer you know, component. That's it. It was, even though we did our best, of course people still experience racism and, you know, and, and, you know, homophobia, transphobia. You can't control that. We cannot be kind of in a world where we kind of live in these imaginary worlds. These, you know, these places are very complicated for all of us. And so, but we could do our best. So they're happy there. <laughs> um, we have some familiar faces here <laughs> in the room, Artrina Paul. 
Um, oh, and that's Paolo Nazareth at the front from Brazil. Hi. Um, so it was really kind of a, a time for everyone kind of coming together. This is the curatorial kind of international group. We've got someone from our own group there too. Like, we've got a whole bunch of Candices there, yeah, um, who came along. And we had parties. <laughs> um, is that it? No, we've got more parties. <laughs> Artists, we've got um, Ms. Risk on the left, who's Lebanese-Australian. We've got Hannah, Catherine Jones on the right, from, who came from London. But they're also DJs, right? And so they were DJing. You know, we just kind of went, hey, who wants the deck? Who wants this? Who wants to cook food? Who wants to? And of course, like people, like the Biennale, I think if we didn't set up these kind of protocols at the beginning, that it'll be like, oh my God, we, you know, this system, it can't happen. We can't do this. This is very, very special photograph. Um, so this is Emily Caraca, who I showed you a photo of before, who's one of Arturo's leading land rights activists. And this here is Tapi. Oh, is that Tapi there? So it's not an angle. Oh, no, this is Tapi, and this is her sister. These are all Mr. Williams' work, um, the late Mr. Williams' work on land rights. And so because both of these families, but from two different countries, are at the forefront of land rights, activism, working with lawyers, working with traditional lands, getting back traditional lands. This is the first time they met. So this was a very special kind of moment for me to, to, to see them come together. So that, like, regardless if they were showing their work or not, that for me was like, that was the bomb. That was the, that was the love. We have Eric Bridgman and his family. So Eric is from PNG. Um, where is he? There he is. And this is his mom. Where's his mom? There. And his cousins. Um, and he, you know, the whole family came and built, and his cousins came over from PNG, built this incredible um, houseman here, and also um, this other structure you can't see. And he closed that off too. He says, No, no, only my community can go there. No one else can go there. Fine. They're the house rules. And so really it was like very much driven by that aspect. It wasn't like, okay, this is a Biennale, it's all open to everyone. You know, because even within indigenous culture, we have women's business and men's business, and not in the sense of how we kind of articulate women's toilets and men's toilets today. It's a lot more fluid than that, but it's definitely different historical pre-colonial ways in which, you know, our communities work, and sometimes in secret. Wonder Nana Bush, so we also did Abaquad. <laughs> you can imagine what the nights were. Here's, Pe <laughs> Here's Pedro and, um, and, and Patrick on the right. So um, they were just deadly, they were amazing um, from Tiwi Island. Um, this is the um, Slay. It's Benji Ra. It's the House of Slay. This is Benji Ra in the middle, a very famous. Filipino Australian performance artist and, and, and incredible her house. Um, oh, this was very very special. So Dion um, was uh, well, he's you know imp is impacted by deafness and muscular dystrophy, and he's done these incredible books with his collaborator. What's her name? What did I forget her name? Where is it? Where is it? Joanna. That's right. Um, and so this was our main. You know, there's always like a like we we kind of inherited this. Um, this talk, you know, that all Biennales have um, by Nick Waterlow, who um, sadly passed away, you know, five years ago, tragically. Um, there was a Nick Waterlow talk, and I said, I wanted a near and yarn. You know, I want, like, you know, this to be kind of driven by someone like Dion. So Dion um, really was this incredible kind of performative act between them both. And the great thing about it is that where he comes from in a remote community, all of his books and all of his artworks are about how many dogs are in the camp. So how many dogs and which dogs are in this side of the camp and which dogs are on that side of the camp. It was really fun. And this is the performance by Olu Collective. Um, have I got like two minutes or... Yep. Yep. Um, this was a really also incredible performance by the Olu Collective uh, because then they would um, run up and whisper into Indigenous or other people's like queer people of you know queer and colour ears and say little things to us. And then when it didn't happen to other people, people would say, "Why aren't you whispering in my ear? Why aren't you whispering in my ear?" So you get the context. Uh, so this is um, one, a part of their manifesto. 
I might let you just read that. So they work in, in Madrid. Um, I was explaining to a few people yesterday. They look after um, trans people of color, um, especially supporting them off the street and into the, into the studio to help you know, feed them, have somewhere to sleep um, through solidarity. And they're from, yeah, as you can see, from Central South America originally. And of course, we all know the Haitian group um, Andre Eugène and others. Um, this is really, just wanted to share these photos because I think just going to someone else's homelands, if you can, you can't go to everyone's homelands. Um, it's just so important to kind of get a context and kind of have a good time as well. Um, I think it's just really important. And Andre Eugène, so Eugène came to Sydney. Um, it was cheaper to bring him to Sydney to make the works, which he loved anyway. Um, then actually bring the works over because there's a monopolization on the, you know, on freight in Haiti. Uh, and this is his work in uh, the Art Gallery of New South Wales next to Matisse, Picasso, Beckman, etc. Um, uh, here we his Corinne Blue. Um, he didn't come, but he's like beautiful sculptures. I just want to show a context. You know, these were made out of found objects, tin cans, etc. Uh, important narrative, uh, and here we are, we're showing them um, in more kind of classical kind of situations in, in the art gallery. Uh, this is what I wanted to show you earlier on. So Mr. Williams work, and we worked with Apple, um, and they did, um, on, they did translations. So you downloaded the, um, the app, and they, so they, they did all these translations of, of, of his of his words from Pitanjara into English. So Jukapa, so Natasha knows Jukapa, it means like the, the um, Betty and Marinka, who, um, two um, senior women artists who are showing at the, in the Yoi exhibition in Berlin, also use this word. They're from the same similar homelands. But he's talking about the importance of uh, Jukupa, Jukupa, I suppose, is the equivalent of your law here. You know, the, the kind of laws that you have to abide by when you're on country. And these are the sort of loops and hoops that you have to go through for the government to, so they acknowledge who you are and acknowledge your lands, etc. These are just shots um, of Eric's work inside the video works that he created. That's his mom and his cousin. <laughs> they also sold things, so they had like a little shop inside as well and gave things away. And then you have Elikura, who's an indigenous Chilean po poet. Um, and we put this on the, on, you know, his poetry on the, on the facade of the Art Gallery of New South Wales, um, which is a, a real coup. Oh, and I actually, I might just jump. Here's Brian Fawata giving a performance work. Arthur Jaffa, we have um, Nicholas. Um, oh my God, I can't believe I forgot. Galanen is one of my mates, how could I forget? So that's Nicholas's work on the right hand side. So on the left hand side, this is in Hyde Park in Sydney. And, you know, during the whole kind of period of 2021, et cetera, but this was surrounded by police. It wasn't like in Britain or somewhere else where everyone was pulling down, you know, the statues. It was very much kind of looked after. Um, and we worked a lot with the council, uh, with the Sydney City Council, and we asked if Nicholas could create a work. It wasn't this, it was similar. Do a collaboration with Pedro and Amira from the Tiwi Islands. And um, we, they kept saying no, and then yes, and then no. And it's like, come on, the Biennale is going to happen. What's wrong with you? Let us create, let, let them create their own like collaborative totem. We kind of sent Nicholas up to the Tiwi Islands, and they both live in communities that live on subsistence or on fishing, etc. You know, they're, they're very busy. You know, during the periods where they can get food for their community, um, and then finally um, we got to see and visit the the mayor of Sydney, Clover Moore. And they said at the end of the day, no, you cannot put a public art in Hyde Park, even though there were all these other statues. 
And we said, why? And then her advisor took us aside and said, well, actually, Brooke, there's an election in six months. And, you know. <laughs> it's like, fine. <laughs> We're going to do our own thing. So this is called Shadow of the Inner Land on the right-hand side. And I'm going to end on this slide. Um, so this is Sarah Mansour from Blacktown um, Poetry Slam. If you don't know them, um, look them up on Instagram or something. They're really awesome. So, sorry, not, yeah, Black, no, Bankstown, sorry, Bankstown um, poetry, poetry Slam. And on the right is um, Takalik Partridge, who's the Inuit woman I was telling you about at the beginning, who we, you know, she um, let us use her Anekdotuk language. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side, you can see a bit of the Inuktitut here, um, next to English. And, but we also had it, I think it was in three different languages. Um, that's right, it was also in Darug language. So it was also in one of the local languages as well. I think I'll just finish there, actually. Yeah. I'm good actually. I have the yeah. Oh, thank you. I wanted to um oops, sorry. I wanted to um start with um the um the the question of linguicide, but then the offerings that you brought in, which is something that you frequently do um, to to share these vocabularies in, in the room. And I was thinking particularly about uh, Winhangana and the way that it strings together to know, remember, and think as a composite site. Because often in colonized tongues, these, are, these become forcefully separated notions. And they are, of course, artificially separated and segregated in that sense, even just these these, these words and these terms while operating in our bodies simultaneously. And so when you share and recuperate, because that's my kind of word perhaps to kind of think about recuperating these vocabularies and offerings, um, do you also think of it as a way to um, contest the idea of immaterial, um, an intangible heritage, because that's for like when bodies like UNESCO and so forth consider literally the the words emerging from um, indigenous and ancestral vocabularies as intangible. That feels the most absurd thing. Um, and I was also kind of thinking about that. This was brought up by Antonio Jabe when looking at liberation music as well as when he said, "What is more tangible than these songs?" that led to our liberation, in a sense. Yeah. What's well, interesting, <laughs> the first thing that came into my head when you said the word intangible is that naraga. So naraga is a Wiradjuri word that just means, like in a, in a humorous way, it means idiot, it means stupid. Um, like when someone's acting up in naraga. Uh, or it can be taken more seriously. I mean, the thing is, is that often there are whole groups of social, political, local, international organizations that try to create spaces for things they don't know about. And so the intangible is one of those things. People don't know about it, and so they shouldn't be doing it or running it or trying to create words to kind of hold it. And that's not a criticism, it's a fact. It's a practical thing, you know, if, if, if you know. And so I think that um, I'm, I'm, I'm never surprised, but I'm always surprised, even working with the word yoi, you know, with the current exhibition name at the Gorkius Bow, the show that we worked on, the struggle it took to get to not just yoi, I mean, I'm very happy that it's an indigenous word, I mean, Pedro and his community are thrilled, you know, to have, you know, an exhibition in, in Europe named after them, you know, after their, it's their song, it's a call to ceremony, um, and much more, but just to get through the kind of 
trauma for other people of colour about linguicide, how they kind of, you know, kind of triggers them about that they don't have a language, but then also how is it that you that you embed that language and then people getting, um, I think, you know, someone used the word woke yesterday, but it's not just woke, it's like everything else around, well, can we use that language? You know, what is this kind of tippy-toeing romantic kind of, you know, thing? It's like when there's been before, it's like slaughter and disaster and crashing and even today, it's like, why all of a sudden there's this kind of, it doesn't make, like it's a, it's a mess, right? And it's kind of like, well, shouldn't we be celebrating? I mean, I, and, you know, it's a very long answer to your thing about intangible, but it's like if you go to Paris, what do you say? Do you say, g'day, hello? Um, I don't know, something else, or do you say bonjour, like regardless if you French, you know, speak French or not? And then why wouldn't you do that with indigenous languages? And I think that, you know, that we, if anything, are, are under this incredible pressure, not only from our own communities, but everyone else to kind of say, explain yourself, or is it intangible, or is it not intangible? So it's not that hard, people, you know, settle down. You know, we're struggling to remember ourselves. Um, and... I think that it's the power, it's about power. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you shared with us these, these views of, of coming together in, in celebration and in uh, sharing strength uh, with each other uh, at Naren. And yet, obviously, something that we, many of us who wish we were there, uh, were, were uh, aware of is also just the way that pandemic kind of cracked down on, on all of us and, uh, and on Niren. And there's something very, um, I don't know, it's sort of, yeah, you have this kind of moment <laughs> and this high and, and then the world shuts down in a strange way but never shuts down because, for instance, obviously we know in many parts of the world and in India, you have migrant labor walking on the streets and the roads, so the world is not shutting down for, for many, many people, many places, but there's Niren, and I don't know, I was really trying to sense these in resonance somehow while being far away. Um, and yeah, I would love to kind of hear a bit more how you navigated that after this incredible effort. Oh, well, well, the best thing about it is that like we were, <laughs> celebrating like Abaquad and the opening and everything and then these huge P&O cruise ships were coming into Sydney Harbour. Those of you who have seen pictures or been to Sydney, you know, it comes in right next to the Museum of Contemporary Art and you've got the Opera House and you've got, the, you know, the Harbour Bridge and it's, it's a spectacular view and we're on the top of the Museum of Contemporary Art going, yeah, we've got this space, it's so great and we're just all meeting together and we're celebrating. All these P&O ships were coming in, all infected with COVID. <laughs> We didn't know at the time, right? And they were actually the first carriers of COVID that came into Sydney. You know, these kind of Australians returning from, from overseas on these, like, tours around the Pacific, because we are in the Pacific. We're in the Asia Pacific. And, uh, but, uh, you know, the thing is, is that there was a bit of panic. You know, some artists were like, get, you know, because their community, because their countries, especially the Western countries like Canada, were like, get home now, we're going to close the borders, that's it. And I know that some people didn't get back to, like... Um, uh, Fatima didn't get back to Peru in time. She had to wait three weeks or something. And, you know, Hitman was talking about, like, being on this flight where there were empty seats and at least she got to lay down and sleep on the way home. But, I mean, in, in the serious side of things, um, I was... It's going to sound bizarre, but I was kind of relieved and it didn't bother me because Indigenous communities are, are often the most at risk when it comes to pandemics. And so communities were shutting down their borders, especially in Australia and overseas. And also, I always had it in my mind that, of course, there were non-Indigenous artists in, 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 in the Biennale, but it, it, it was about kind of looking at the reality of what it was and there were some artists that couldn't travel anyway for visa issues or kind of other issues, um, or they just, why, why make that journey? Um, and so I think that uh, the good thing is that it did open a few times. New South Wales, the state of New South Wales had very different laws. It was a conservative government, and so it had like different laws on opening and closing, which also had its benefits as well, where uh, the state of Victoria, where I was in, like all of our, I don't want to go on this about this too much, but all the states closed to each other for a long time. And so for Niren to continue its own thing was important to acknowledge 
the, the opening and the coming together at the beginning and then hopefully the kind of lasting legacies it had on people who did come together and those who couldn't, like the connections that we had with them. So it was really about this kind of ongoing kind of connection and making sure that people were safe. Mm. And that also actually brings me into the next question where um, it feels at times that there are these uh, quite kind of ignorant and uh, obnoxious ways of even inquiring um, into, um, oh, did so-and-so um, indigenous elder artist uh, travel? I mean, that was something I, I heard in Berlin and I you know just want to acknowledge that. Um, and obviously, I wasn't the right person to fully answer that, but it was something I also, you know, talked to you about to kind of at least be better, uh, better suited to 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 share. Obviously, like, what does it mean to um, demand or inquire why an Aboriginal elder artist is not coming to Berlin? In fact, while the pandemic is still ongoing um, and while it has caused mm. so much damage. Um, this, this, in a sense, I'm also kind of, kind of thinking through this, the voracious appetite of the art world to, in a sense, demand, consume certain kinds of practices and knowledges. You know, how, how do we protect the communities and, and yeah, and sort of not give in to that like voracious demand for presence, in a sense, where it might not be healthy, desired, you know. Mm. But, you know, I just think it's about kind of the level playing field. So you'll have very famous, you know, like there was a question or kind of comment about like the art genius artist or the famous artist yesterday. They will say, I'm not going to that. I'm not going to go to that. I, I might go to that. Oh, I might change my mind in the last minute. They, can, they seem to be able to do that. Fine. Oh, so, you know, sorry, they can't come. Or, oh, yes, actually they are going to come. We're going to give them a first class ticket or a business class ticket or something like that. Completely the world is their oyster. When it comes to especially Indigenous elders or other people, they might or may or may not want to go. But they may not be able to go because of sorry business, you know, which is funeral time or something else, or they're in charge of or, you know, a very important story and there's a ceremony coming up. But even people who are not living on traditional lands also have these kind of commitments living in city spaces as well. City spaces are also Indigenous spaces. And so I think that coming back to this thing about the art world and the artist genius conversation, etc., I think it's also about that, not just about indigeneity. It's about saying, oh, OK, number one, has that artist even been informed? Because I know Betty and Marinka weren't even informed. When I heard about that conversation, there wasn't even a budget. No one even said, oh, hi, we've got $20,000 to bring this to, you know, 75-year-old <laughs> one who has, you know, um, you know uh, onset dementia, et cetera. Um, let alone the minder, a translator. I mean, she speaks five languages, you know, like people saying yesterday, their fourth or fifth or third or second language is English. Um, same situation. So I really think it's the kind of attitude, again, around hierarchies of fame. Yeah. But in regards to the Indigenous perspective, absolutely, it's kind of like, uh, oh, they're available. Of course they will want to come. Um, no. And, 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 and I think this is a very complicated space because there's this kind of earnest kind of relationship sometimes which is not anyone's fault and it kind of comes back to this thing about what you mentioned in regards to, you know, um, oh, what, what did you say before, the um, question before about um, the UNESCO mm. and language. You know, it's it's a kind of a, a similar situation. It's like, well, who is who who really holds the power? Because if artists are powerful, I'd like to see how that shifts. Hmm. But then, when you are, uh, I'm going to open up. It's open, actually. We're open. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Um, just just to quickly quickly um, check in uh, because in this edition. Uh, we are, as we said, sort of, it's not obviously a theme because we don't do themes, um, but the presence of the artist as organizer is, and as curator is obviously apparent here. Um, so I do want to still then probe, because this is also something we've talked about, that it's not the same, that, you know, 
you are playing these multiple roles. And when you play these multiple roles, there is a different sense of responsibility, accountability, power, ways of challenging process, institutions. So could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think, you know, I think there's different people playing that role of different generations here. And I think, yeah, it would be really helpful to mm, think through the mm, yeah, mm, complicities mm. and complexities of it. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, we have our core, you know, spiritual core, physical core, intuitive core, whatever you want to call your core. We have our core, right? It's what gets us up in the morning. It's what puts us to sleep or keeps us awake. Whatever that core is, it is exhausting, you know? And I think that, but it's your core also, your connection to whatever you believe in that keeps you going, that keeps you, you know, kind of, it's like you're attracted to things and people are drawn together. There's this kind of invisible thing that, that happens, and and that's why I think that structurally, the kind of Western way of thinking about art, and I know that you know many artists talk about it, and um, I know that the, the the shows here talk about that, and kind of look to Western, um, you know, artistic expression and the power of that, etc. But that is a broken system. You know, and it's and it's. I think it's been broken for a long time, but people don't want to talk about it because it's almost like it's a negative thing to say. But it's okay. If things are broken. There's a reason why they're broken. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's like if you break a beautiful vase you get from your grandmother and you break it. Well, it's a reason why it's broken. I'm always going to remember that. And I think that there needs to be a moving on from that. And the, and then we were even talking about being a junk curators or you know what is it that we do in our spaces or how can we be you know hands length but also connected to how is it that I can create my artwork and sometimes when I create my artwork I go oh that that was pretty shit actually like you know I didn't give myself enough time for that. Um, so they are tricky spaces, they're exhausting spaces, but I think that being in places like this now like with my community and meeting new people too, it's worth it. But I think that there needs to be more ways of understanding time and connectivity and kinship, which has come up a lot, which is not about anxiety. Because I think that within the institutional framework of doing things, it's like you're not here on time, you know, you have to talk about this and sign that budget off on this time. Like the whole system itself is broken anyway. So there are indigenous methodologies, and I even hate the word methodology, there is Yindyamara, right, where we work, I'm mean, even at the University of Melbourne now, the director of reimagining museums and collections, <laughs> you know, what the hell does that even mean? But like I speak with my indigenous colleagues, Carol Christofferson, and the others are freaking out about like, oh, you know, is this person going to come down and do this talk from that community and when is it going to happen? And the other people are going, oh, we have to tell everyone it has to be on this time. And it's like, just take a chill pill. They will turn up when they turn up. Oh, no, we can't run it like this. And, of course, everything falls into place and then everything goes out in, on time. You know, so there is a different sense of time. So I'm not saying it's the only way to do things, but I think the people, there needs to be a bit more generosity and kind of leverage, you know, a bit more kind of space to kind of allow for those things to happen. And you don't have to be attached to it. You don't have to let it, do you know what I mean? Kind of, I don't know if it's answering your question, but to be in this space, I think the, the sweet, spot is a, sweet spot is kind of self, radical self-love and madam gedule healing and just, you know, connect with the people you need to. And also say no, it's okay, you know? It's okay to say no. And, and to say, next June, I might be free. Work it out. Um, it may not always work if you need money, because that's another thing that doesn't even go there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Brooke, for this super important presentation and uh, bringing this issue of uh, the struggle of language, you know, and how we negotiate with it better. Uh, well, I mean, and also in a way, I mean, this presentation for me is uh, decolonizing me from decolonial discourses, <laughs> if it makes any sense. Uh, because yesterday we were also discussing, you know, how um, uh, this cosmovisionic healing from the indigenous vocabulary is now being quite seduced by the art industry as well. But uh, how much time and investment we make on looking into language and uh, not only thinking it from the side of the uh, location where this uh, Biennale, uh, Biennale or event is operated. Hello? Okay. Uh, 
so it's uh, the the choice of language when it comes for for a biennale or a festival you know i mean mostly it comes from i mean i i believe two sides you know the local language the location where the event is happening or the contributing sides of the artist uh, uh, who are showing the work uh, but is there any way to think about a translocal vocabulary when we are not thinking of this traditional uh, audience development by you know this uh, viewership that we think of uh, uh, based on a physical location, especially. Uh, and how we do that, because uh, it talks about this, um, also this question of resources, infrastructure resource to talk about language, and it's so multi-layered. I mean, it's not only one language you choose, like in Bangla, there's this colloquial. Uh, so how you also negotiate between that, you know, the formal and the colloquial, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, apart from language coming from a location, how we also think of, you know, uh, just making this translocal outreach. Maybe it's not a question only to you, to me, to uh, all of us in this room, uh, but as you were just reminding us to get slow and take responsibility. Mm. <laughs> so how do you take responsibility on this language now? Let's talk about resources first. Yeah. There are plenty of resources. There are no lack of resources. It's just about who's allocating those resources and who's, who, who's allowing for those resources to go somewhere. That's, that's then who it's protecting and who it's not protecting. So, mm, and uh, the thing is, I can only speak from my position as a Wiradjuri Celtic person. That's my cultural perspective. That's what I was growing up, growing up with, my, with my own protocols. When I go overseas or go into other people's homelands, I'm by their laws. And, you know, if it's in neutral, interesting spaces like in Berlin, it's a very long, contracted kind of conversation about language, like I kind of mentioned before, Natasha was there firsthand, but, but I think that, you know, it's, it's just about not having any fear. And I think that there's a lot of fear, a lot of guilt, a lot of fear, a lot of regret, a lot of, um, um, yeah, I think you get, get the picture. And I think that there needs to be more experimentation. I think there needs to be more falling into the unknown because we're constantly in the unknown. And the unknown is where the magic is. You know, I really think that. I really believe that. And because in some ways, if we're all in this space of unknown, we're all a bit vulnerable, you know? And maybe we can start to share things and be open-minded about things or change things. And why can't things change? I mean, I think we create rules that are really unnecessary. Um, and I think that, you know, even the word colonization has its own kind of bizarre effect, you know, vibration, because it's not the same for everybody, and it's become like a dirty word now. And so I think that, yeah, I should come back to the local, and yes, it is complicated, but that's okay. There's, you know, you're not gonna, we're not going to solve it all. I don't think this is about solving anything. We're not going to solve anything, because quite frankly, in some ways, I think nothing needs to be solved. If anything, we need to maybe just be a bit more open to, you know, to doing things a little bit different or experimenting or giving space for people. Um, I think this is what creativity is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be creating legacies. I think that's broken now. That's done. You know, I think Picasso came up a few times. That's enough. <laughs> um. There's one over here. It's nice if you can stand up if you can get you for the live audience, for the online audience, I think. Uh, I'm from Tanjim's question. It's Is it on? Okay. I'm from uh, Tanjim's The mic on? Question itself. Did you do it or not? No, it's not. Oh, yeah. Stay, Natasha. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, uh, coming from the same question, like uh, in a lot of the times we are actually occupying places built by our oppressors with pedagogies that 
pedagogies, etiquettes and customs that does not exist in their world, culture and language. So I wanted to ask, like, does this become, like, since you are in such a place for a very long time, does this become a respectful cohabitation or we need to focus more on building new places from the ground up? And a as you also mentioned that resources are a problem. So, uh, so when we can, should we or should we not? Like build places that are completely separate from the culture of the, or the customs of the oppressor class. And how do we go about that? Because uh, like, because of us being in a colonized space for a long time, a lot of things get intertwined and we cannot just ignore that. No, absolutely. There is no, there is no, well, I can't say there is no particular division. Of course there is a division, but I mean, I think that through, I can only speak through my own experience. All of you here have extraordinary experience, especially the youth in the older, elders, um, because you're at the cusp of, 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 of life. Um, but, you know, I think it depends on the situation. Sometimes it's, t it's just really difficult. And sometimes it takes 20 years to build a space. Sometimes it takes 10 years. Sometimes it's three years. And what is that space and how does it shift? Um, but I think that for me, the way in which I have been taught by my elders and my family is that when you're on someone else's lands, you go and you follow what their customs are. Or you talk to them about it. And sometimes you cannot always follow it because you may not follow you know, we might not know them, but even when I go to, 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 to Paris, or if I go to Sharjah, which, you know, I have been recently, there are particular things you can and can't talk about, like, you know, my homosexuality and things like that, even though the people know that, like, it's still, like, very much part of that custom, and even though I don't agree with it, I'm not going to go and tell them what they should do with their own life, you know, or with their customs, regardless if that's a good or a bad thing. I think that we have to make choices around safety as well. Um, but I think that also it's important to empower yourself and to find people who are like-minded so you have the support network. Because if one day you will find yourself alone if you don't have that support network, and it's devastating. Like, and you can disappear, or not just physically, but also like emotionally, etc. And I think it's important to reach out to the world. There are international, you know, I know it doesn't save everything, but like there are incredible international collectives, groups, people who, who are wanting the same, you know, and I think that we're very lucky to have this digital world at the moment. It's a very powerful tool that we can manifest and create space to actually be within that. It connects us to things. And, and that's one thing about coming back to your question about Niran, you know, I mean, what happens after, you know, the, the pa pandemic? Well, we've got the internet, you know, and we've got all these other things and we're resourceful and we're used to being in these spaces. Um, it's quite a privilege to be able to go all the way to the southern part of the world, to, to Sydney, you know, um, and expensive and everything else to go and sure, experience that, but not everyone is going to experience that. Um, but coming back to your question, I don't have all the answers and I know that with you and your community and your collective that you're doing, I will just encourage you to just feel radical self-love and power within that space, regardless if people outside of your door see you or not, because I think that if you're not strong within your core, whatever decisions you need to do outside of that, it's going to be really hard. Um, and that's my perspective, yeah? I mean, there are many other beautiful, unique perspectives around power, but um, I mentioned to, to you and a few other people the ILU Collective before, and they're incredible workers, and, you know, they want to connect with people. Hmm. Thank you, um, Brooke, and everyone else uh, for engaging in this conversation. Uh, we continue at the end of the day as well. There is no break. <laughs>
Aki Thami um, is a Janajati indigenous artist from the Himalayas. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm reading this now, so I think we're gonna have to be quiet, sit down, or leave. Sorry. She lives and works in Bombay. Aki uh, uses social exchanges and develops safe spaces to position art as a medium of healing in community. Sister Library is 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 one example uh, of how her presence is felt uh, in Bombay, but also in other places where she shares her work. Her interdisciplinary practice ranges from ceremonial interventions, performances, drawings, zine making, fly posting, and public interventions that are brought together through various forms of um, engagement and collective involvement. Uh, most of her work is self-funded and realized in collaboration. She's going to be sitting, um, sitting from there uh, diagonally opposite to me um, and sharing uh, also not only images but also videos and so that's, that's more comfortable for her. Yeah, uh, so as you, as you see in front here, there's uh, some of the, the zines, um, the pamphlets, the sister zine, sister times, a lot of other uh, wonderful work that, that has been coming out of uh, the collaborations and the reading groups and the workshops and the many other things. So please feel welcome to spend time with it. Sorry, we still have some work to do. Yeah. But Seva, everyone, welcome. Thank you so much, Natasha. I'm sorry I was like doing something, <laughs> so I could not listen to what you said, but so happy to be here. I've written notes because I tend to forget and like drift away. To begin, I acknowledge the presence of and give thanks to the ancestors, our guardians, the spirits, and all the sacred beings guiding us, protecting us, gratitude for bringing us together in this moment to be present to one another and witness one another. Um, this is a very special time for me. <laughs> um, I come from a place called Darjeeling, which is not very far away from here. Uh, and. Um, I have been traveling a bit and I work in Bombay, so I often talk about who I am and what my life is and how it has been shaped by uh, who I am and where I come from. But this is the first time I'm going to be talking about who I am and why I am the way I am, so close to home. Um, we are also trying to figure out <laughs> WhatsApp on the laptop because I want to make a phone call back to Sister Library where you will be able to meet a bunch of our superstar kids who are um, in a fellowship program that we started. It's called Walking with Savitri Mai. For all of us in South Asia and hopefully for the ones outside, you know who Savitri Mai was. Savitri Mai is the person that is responsible for like you know us being here and like as women all women from all caste and all race racial backgrounds like she's the reason why we could go to school she's the reason why we could access education and uh, just one second sorry See, you can tell I'm not very good with tech. <laughs> yeah, so we started a fellowship program 
when we started the library and you'll probably be able to see the children who are in the library today and I really wanted to make this video call because they are there and it's exciting to show them where I am and maybe you'll get to see the library as well. Ah, great. Okay. Should I try and call it? No, just one second. Okay, I'll call them now, now that I know that it's going to work. I'm going to call them, but um, yeah, where's my presentation? Right here. I'm sorry, I'm so bad with these <coughs> things, you guys. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you, Joshua. Okay, I hope everything is going to go smooth now. All right. Um, you can read about me there, but um, I present myself as Aki, the granddaughter of matriarchs Guma Thangmi and Mala Chamling. I am a member of the Himalayan Kirati community, and um, I live and work in Bombay. I work within a framework of multidisciplinary practice inspired by participant involvement with themes of being, doing, and imagining together. So in my work, like, uh, I do a lot of DIY. Um, my <laughs> printing and zine making practice comes from DIY, but also uh, performances, site-specific performances and performances in public places. I like working um, in public, like street spaces, and um, I also think about um, doing together a lot and um, try to build spaces where we can come together and do things together. But what I've not mentioned here is that I also have a very conscious practice of don't do it, which is non-participatory, not participating in certain structures. And uh, it's a conscious choice, um, but also a choice towards self-preservation of sorts. Um, so this is a picture from Bombay Underground, uh, Bombay Zine Fest. I think this was the third year. And then you can see Himanshu here. If you read in the last slide, you saw that we run Bombay Underground and Dharavi Art Room together. And Himanshu is this like, amazing, really great human being and a friend. And we've been like publishing together, doing all sorts of illegal <laughs> Acts and uh, Bombay Zine Fest happens to be, be one of those things. And um, we started six years back. This year, we had the sixth Bombay Zine Fest. All Bombay Zine Fest has been independently done. We have no sponsors. We have no monies coming in from anywhere. And I think that is what makes it so great. When we started six years back, there were no zine makers to table in the zine fest. So what we did is we collected parchas and publications from small presses and presses that uh, made works in Marathi and other Indian languages. And we also have friends all across the world, zinesters, and we collected zines and then we showed it to the larger public. We have been like making zines and prints and publications before that as well. But then we thought like maybe it's time for us to do like a proper festival. And then so we did it, and uh, and um, yeah, what was I going to say? Yeah, the next year on, we had tablers from India. So like tablers, as in like zine makers, who had their own table to like show their works and exchange and talk about their works with people who are interested in printmaking and zine making and like this entire DIY culture. And then every year it has been growing and growing and growing. And every year we make sure that there are at least. 10 new zine makers who get to table, just like to sort of diversify the scene as well. But uh, yeah, apart from Bombay Zine Fest, like we do a lot of other things. One of the things that we do is, okay. I prefer this, but is this not working this at all? Working. Okay. No, no. I don't think it's working. Is it working? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, all the complications must happen when I'm presenting, yeah? <laughs> uh, technology is racist. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, so like, uh, apart from the Zine Fest, we do publications. We also work with grassroots movements 
to make uh, prints and posters and sort of like uh, scenes for them as well so that the work that they're doing is circulated. Um, what else do we do as Bombay Underground? Yeah, we just like do a lot of things that I shouldn't be talking about. But uh, this is Dharavi Art Room, which is uh, a community-based artist-run space in Dharavi. So Dharavi is like the heart of Bombay because it's like smack in the center of the city. And Dharavi Art Room is in the heart of Dharavi because it's like in the center of Dharavi. And I call it the heart of Bombay because it's like just like a really pulsating like space where every house is also a manufacturing unit. So like really economically viable for the city, which is one singular reason why it has not been removed from the city yet. But uh, Dharavi is sitting on this like multi um, million euro Dharavi redevelopment project because like real estate wise Dharavi is like, you know, Everybody from Bombay knows like it's right there and nobody wants to go there. But this space is a great space because it's a space of uh, just resting and having fun. And like when you enter this space, you know that nobody is going to bully you, nobody is going to hate on you. And we created this space for uh, women and for children because Dharavi is also a really dense place and uh, it used to be, um, I mean it still is, it's uh, one of the indigenous neighborhoods, like it's, it used to be a Kolivara and then like most Kolivaras in Bombay, it was open for people to come and like settle down and it was easy for people to start living there and most of the people who came to Bombay and settled in Dharavi came because of persecution that they faced in their villages and like you know just for like a better livelihood and so like so many people being in the same space also meant that there wasn't many open spaces for children and women to just go to and be with and also because like I mentioned Dharavi like manufacturing unit every house lots of work so a space where you do not have to work um, so yeah, Dharavi Artrum became that space, but because we've been in Dharavi for like 20 years now, it has also sort of become like a community archive where um, people, like because the works are made by the children, made by the women, it's their own perspective of what Dharavi is, how they see Dharavi, how they experience Dharavi, and sort of like a documentation of their own life and the neighborhood because of all, like, uh, like <laughs> of, because of everything that Dharavi is, it also has an influx of researchers and artists and thinkers that come to Dharavi to like try to understand. So, how do people live like this? How do you like you know make the best use of the space and trying to learn sustainability and very many things. And in that, what happens is that the kind of idea of Dharavi that is uh, popular in the larger popular discourse of things isn't something that people are happy with. So, so like the works that the people in Dharavi have created sort of becomes like a space where they are more comfortable to go back and look. And uh, the Dharavi redevelopment project is not like you know it's not executed in full swing but like they have been like works and like slowly slowly it's like chipping in and so there have been like constructions of metro lines around Dharavi and then there's always constant relocation of people and people have had to move out of Dharavi into like further um, edges of the city but because Dharavi is like where they first moved into so they often come back and when they come back they look at all the works and then they think about oh yeah this is this was my school this is where I used to play and then this is where my mom used to sell you know XYZ and so it has become like a very organic uh, archival space as well. Um, what else is Dharavi Atram? So many things but maybe I'll talk about it later. And this is the library maybe we can do the call now instead of just looking at a picture. I'm so excited to do this call. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Bitter. <laughs> 
कैसे हो दिस इज मैं ठीक हूँ बेटा ए बेटा एक मिनट में आपके साथ बात करूंगी और मैं सबके साथ भी बात करूंगी ठीक है ये दिस इज राज कुमार ही गोज टू जे जे स्कूल ऑफ आर्ट ही इज वन ऑफ आवर फर्स्ट किड्स फ्रॉम धारावी टू गो टू यूनिवर्सिटी सब लोगों को दिखाओ हाय बोलना है बेटा आप कैसे हो हेलो <laughs> कैसे चल रहा है हेलो 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 कैसे चल रहा है Oh my goodness hi 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 Hello Ulta sulta mat karo Acha theek hai Great Beta main idhar ek conference mein hu Sab ko dikhao beta book select kiya sab ne aaj ke liye एक ग्रुप दो ग्रुप ने सिलेक्ट किया है दो ग्रुप बाकी है सिलेक्ट करने के लिए अच्छा ठीक है बेटा जो बुक सिलेक्ट करेंगे मुझको फोटो भेजना फिर मुझको रीडिंग देखना है कि कैसे हो रहा है ठीक है ठीक है चलो दीदी बाद में बात करती हूँ मैं इधर कॉन्फ्रेंस में एवरी वन से हाई टू दिड्स ग्रेट ठीक है बाद में बात करते है बाय दीदी Okay, successful. All right, great. <laughs> How can I move back? Just click. Okay. Um, yeah. So every week, like the kids from the fellowship program come to the library, and then like they like they are given, they choose a book that they want to read, and then. Uh, they take the book back to the art room. Most of the kids who are in the fellowship program come from Dharavi. Oh, I'll tell you what the fellowship program is. So <laughs> we cover their school and college, like school through college, and then we work uh, with their parents, like sort of to convince them that uh, they do not have to get their daughters married and they do not have to like, you know, quit school to work at home because we are going to cover their uh, school and college expenses. But like once they grow up, there's also an expectation that they start earning for the family. So we also have to almost in a way sort of like buy their time by giving them a stipend, which is which equals to the um, the salaries that they might get working in a factory or like a paper making unit or like an embroidery or like all these of this fast fashion like enterprises. So yeah, that is the, Uh, working with Savitri, my fellowship. But um, last year, for the first time, we had five of our kids join one of the biggest, uh, most popular, well-known uh, colleges, universities in Bombay. It's called Sophia's, and uh, it is great because they are the first in their families, first women in their families, to be going to a college. And it's just like not any college. It's like a really great place for someone like. even me like but you know but for someone from dharavi to go to where you have like all of the screen and like lots of spaces and cats really great so priyanka has gone there so you can understand like what kind of college <laughs> it is <laughs> and uh, two of our kids are going to jj school of art which everybody knows here like it is a really nice place for them to be at also and yeah we are excited to like have more and more of our kids have access to these spaces because um, Yeah, everybody should have access to these spaces. And okay, before I start talking about like where I come from, I want to play a video and listen to some music. How do I go to the? Oh, right there. Okay. So um a few uh think just over uh just about over a month back a really dear friend of mine a friend of ours um okay um
Okay. Um, yeah, a friend of ours went missing uh, about like a little over a month back and uh, she's just like, she's an amazing artist and uh, just want to take the space to celebrate her work and I hope that she returns back. I ventured hungry into the world, seven pairs of ears unfurled, double steps and sudden twirls, must have seemed a strange creature, looks as if nothing can reach her, but the lost song, ancient song. I remember the day, sisters refused to comb their hair, and brothers cut off their own braids. But before the language has died, the many spirit siblings will revive the lost laughter, ancient laughter. Made of breath and muddy hands, so deep the bond with anguished land that they mistake us for warrior clans. The beat, the bloom, and shadow play make barbed wire fences melt away for the lost children. The ancient children. And as I pray for their return, sharpen tools that help discern the danger that lurks at every turn. Before the thought came intuition, matter can work to mind's vision, holding close innocent origins of the lost people, the ancient people. Okay, sorry about that, but not sorry. Um, we have a wound and we are not allowed to allow the time to heal and we are not allowed to talk about it. And uh, yeah, so you have to witness this. Uh, where's the presentation? Of course. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, do you have the clicker? I want to just like point the. Okay. Up, down, up, yeah. no. All right. Yeah, so uh, I want to talk about the nation state and the joke that it is. Uh, it was, uh, it's this part of the world that I come from. And you can see the number of nation states that surrounds this place. Uh, this place was when the nation was formed, it was a part of Pakistan for three days. So when the national flag of India unfloored in all the other places, we had the Pakistani flag. And after three days, the government of India realized that, no, this is like a very economically viable space, so we must have it under us. And so that is the story of how Darjeeling became a part of India, because they just were like, OK, let's shift the borders a little bit and make a new map and whatever. And all right. Um, is. Sorry, I have to go back to my notes so that I do not lose track. Uh -huh. 
I also want to talk about how this part of the land is uh, shaped history a lot and I want to bring attention to how the greed and control that comes with colonization has shaped not just our lives but lives of many many people throughout the world. Uh, so my great grandparents were sold into the tea plantation as slave labor. I come from three generations of enslaved people. And um, my story of overcoming is not just my own story. Like I could only overcome or I'm overcoming because of my community and which is the reason why I have to talk about what is happening. What started as the opium wars, which we all know in history, should have actually been called the tea war because it started because of tea. And uh, I don't know if you're aware of that, but it's not just tea, like it's not what, it's not just uh, like, you know, the plantation slavery with tea that altered our life and like scarred us forever. It also changed the elevation and the slope. So when my great grandparents were enslaved, they had to break the mountain into soil for the plantation to happen. And they changed the contour of the mountain, they changed the slope, they changed the elevation. But it was also, after the tea plantation started, it also propelled many different forms of slavery in many different plantations, including the sugar plantation all across the world. <coughs> so it is not just like what's happening here, it also like affected other people across the world. Uh, I think like this picture is a very great representation of what the tea plantation was and how like, you know, I, I get very like, every time I go to museums and I look at archival images of Darjeeling, I find images like this and how they just, they don't even try like, you know, to mask their like colonial pride, like it's just out there for everyone to see. Um, how do I go forward? Uh -huh. Okay, that is my great. That is my grandfather actually. So, yeah, I want to talk about uh, men and women and how they were treated because of colonization. Uh, women were enslaved in the tea plantation, and men were mostly seen as mercenaries, and they were employed in the military. So we had the queen's own. Uh, Gorkha uh, regiment, which now has also become like the Indian Gorkha regiment. And uh, so they just send our men to war and borders and there's just no value for human life. I never saw my grandfather. And the <laughs> funny thing is that it's not the British only who enslaved our peoples because after the British left, the colonization went on in the hands of the Indian government and Bengal. This is uh, one of the works that I did. Uh, it's uh, from, uh, this, this is, uh, was also observed in a gallery in Delhi. Um, I started sitting and remembering all the people who were killed, uh, massacred, murdered by the military, deployed in Darjeeling. Just uh, between 1986 to 1987, the communist government of Bengal killed 1,200 people in one year, 1,200 civilians. Uh, and a lot of the bodies were not found. The number, the governmental figure was 1,200 and there is like, if that's the official count, we all know like how official counts are. There were also like many people who were just lost and um, yeah, we could never tell like where they are. Um, so I think it was two years back when I started this practice of remembering and recalling. This work is called uh, Ceremony to Be a Witness and just that space to like, you know, recognize their life and just honor that they were here and then also allow for us to experience their presence in this space. Uh, it was ob observed in the gallery, but like my practice was remembering uh, uh, an elder every day, uh, 
a family member, a friend who was taken from us. This is my mother. Oh, I also want to talk about, it's not just the communist government. Under Mamta Banerjee, uh, in 2017, when Bengali language was enforced on our people, <laughs> People were killed again. Every few years, we have the military deployed. And uh, there was a total shutdown of internet, phone lines, and electricity, along with roads and airways and every other means. The only way to communicate to people would be, would be via military uh, satellite phone. And uh, so when you talk about impunity, like, you know, 100 days, over 100 days of total shutdown, food had become a major crisis. I couldn't tell if my parents had eaten or not, like, what is happening. And, uh, and then I was in Montreal <laughs> doing a residency, and uh, 30 military men took over my house because my parents are activists and... They broke down our house because they wanted to arrest my parents. Uh, it could mean anything. And so they disappeared. Like, I couldn't know. Like, I couldn't trace them. Nobody knew. The phones were not accessible. I just knew that, OK, uh, the house is gone. And uh, yeah, so this was just in 2017. And it's like a really <laughs> funny thing because I was really troubled. But at the same time, I was in Canada where the Truth and Reconciliation Committee was happening, like when indigenous peoples were talking about the, uh, what is it called, the residential school and uh, all the pain, like, you know, resurfacing. So it was, I felt very held by the community there because they could understand my pain and what I was going through. And that was also the time when I started to put down in writing what I wanted the library to look like, like, you know, a space of coming together and a space of doing so, like, I guess, like, great pain and, <laughs> like, it kind of, like, brought in what I wanted the library to be. And uh, does this work? Yeah. Uh, this is a work that I did recently to honor my grandmother who worked in, one of my grandmothers who worked in the tea plantation all her life because her parents, my great grandparents also had to work in the tea plantation all their lives because that's how like colonial plantation slavery works, right? So, um, yeah, this, I don't know how, like in all of my travels, I would always, I only buy secondhand clothes. So every time I'd go to like a thrift shop or a secondhand market, I would gravitate towards buying these like really nice, like colonial uh, teacups and saucers and, uh, you know, uh, teapots and things around tea. And uh, when my grandmother, she passed into another realm in November last year, I just felt, like this need of, you know, undoing like all the, like the hate that she might have gone through all this life and just, I wanted to destruct the idea of like beauty that these objects hold. And so that is, that is my grandmother's tea basket. Those are her tools that she used in the garden every day. And so, uh, yeah. I offered a tea party where I invited everyone and filled all these like tea, the cups with tea. And then I broke all the cups and invited people to come. And so like after the performance, after the ceremony, I invited people to come and build new works, new sculptures from the broken pieces of the, uh, yeah, like non-tea wares. <laughs> and uh, build a small shrine for my grandmother to recognize the work that she did and just undo all of that, like the implicit violence in that. So this is why I have to talk about who I am and uh, where I come from and why I work the way I work. Um, because like, you know, I, in all of this, I forget to mention that I left home when I was 15 and it was not like out of willingness and choice. Like, you know, I don't come from like a 
like, I don't come from wealth. There are also people in Darjeeling and like, you know, in other parts of the northeastern states who have wealth and then they travel because they have made the choice to travel. I had to leave because it was a matter of like safety and my parents were like, no, we have just two girls. You have to go out and I practically like brought myself up and then there's always this feeling of like being displaced and like longing to like you know be in community and in my practice over the years I have like thought so much about like how working towards and also like this push towards like oh you know you can go to your therapist and like work on your own healing and strengthen yourself and then go out there and face the world it does not really work because like you know the world is broken and like you know it's just it's not going to work for someone like me and so this longing this desire to be in community to doing things together to creating spaces that nurture us and sustain us and you know we take care of each other we don't have lots and we in a way we're not even looking for lots we just want to have our spaces so that we can just be um, and sister library is one of those spaces as you already saw how happy everyone was um, yeah, so in 2017, I'm sorry, my notes are all over because I started crying, but yeah, in 2017, I wrote down a proposal of what I wanted the library to be, and in that I was also thinking about like everything about libraries, and I have been very fortunate, even though like I had to leave home at 15, I had to take care of myself, I had to do like my own high school, then I had to take myself to college, and I had to do my own admission, but it also gave me like lots of opportunity to choose and understand what I wanted to do. And oh, slowly over the years, like up until my doctoral studies now, like it has all been like things that I wanted to do because I wanted to do it, not because like, you know, the market is influencing me or like for other factors. Uh, so, because I have been like partly in academia but also outside and also as a person who is always going to be outside, I think about libraries a lot and how the design of the space and the rules around the space and all of these, spa the, all of these specifications around libraries are not very conducive to learning for someone like me. I'm sorry, am I running out of time? Okay, I'll quickly finish. Yeah, so that's how like I designed Sister Library. That's how it looks very different from what a regular normal library would look. I only have pictures now to show. Uh, yeah, these are some of the works. And this is just like girls having fun outside library. This is from a permanent installation at the Goethe Institute in Dhaka. We travel a lot with the library. And we have a press. We have a press. <laughs> and then you have some of the stuff from the press here. We also have open access at the press. And... Uh, yeah, this is Sister Press. We try to make it as uh, as uh, sensitive to the environment as possible because we are living in a climate emergency. So we use risograph, and everything made in risograph can be composted. That is our press. The, those are some of our centerfold posters that you can find in every newspaper that we publish. This is from an event. And look, we have a superstar. <laughs> Let's come to our event. So it's like, you know, everyone comes. Like, it's not just like kids from Dharavi. Like, everyone from Mandra and everywhere, uh, they come to the library. We have a radio. Everyone listen to the radio, please. It's available on all streaming platforms. And yes, uh, the picture, this picture is from our travels to the Northeast, which is also supported by Experimenta. This picture is from Kohima, and that is inside the library. Okay, this is more pictures of the library. Uh, when Bell Hooks passed away last year, we made this poster. It is in Hackney? No, it is in uh, Peckham. We made this picture in Peckham, the poster in Peckham. That's it. I'm done. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Thank you for uh, bringing yourself and, um, and members and users of the library to us today into Experimenter. Um, we uh, just recently got to know each other and I, I was really struck firstly even just by the, under, the, the, the notion of sisterhood as it is uh, active in your practice. Um, and so this, this whole way in which um, Sister Times and Sister Press and, and, and all these, and Sister Library being sort of these different uh, portals and, and, uh, and spaces of inhabitation of, of really also contesting a certain notion of, um, of relatedness and promoting and propagating other understandings um, of sisterhood made me very grateful um, for what you do and also to sort of think back to just what it means to um, produce uh, writing together as women and I, there's um, so many legacies of, of, of women producing writing um, as, as sisters and in sisterhood and so before coming to the library I just thought of like the, the struggle of writing um, and what it means for women to take up the task of writing. Um, and just wanted to uh, read this a short passage, is when we uh, invited Sister Library into uh, Columboscope, there was this uh, reading room that was called Reading in Tongues um, that was dedicated to Gloria Anzaldua's letter to third world women. And so just to read shortly from that, um, how hard it is for us to think we can choose to become writers, much less feel and believe that we can. What have we to contribute, to give? Our own expectations condition us. Does not our class, our culture, as, as well as the white man tell us writing is not for women such as us? So this is just one one fourth probably, and then there's so many um, other ways in which to add on to that, that question, that um, playing against expectations and self-doubt. I know self-doubt was something that came up as well. Um, so yeah, I just want to, to thank you uh, again from um, Anushka and myself for sort of um, making, making uh, the presence of Sister Library felt not only in India, but um, across the region. I think that, that feels very important at this time. Um, and so maybe to just talk a little bit more about sort of circulation as well, because one is how you, how your practice and, and creating these moments of remembering and recall, as you spoke about, um, are ways of, of um, sharing within, say, a gallery, but also in public sites at all times and whenever you feel like uh, you want to take that role on. But when, how, what is your sort of way of circulating the, the kind of publishing and zines. This, if you could just maybe talk a little bit more about that, because they have spread far and wide in, in just a short time span. I get to. Okay, <laughs> Hello. Good. Um, yeah, so I don't have like one plan. And I also feel like when I make something, it gets its own life. And like, you know, it becomes like sort of like a sentient being. And it just like goes wherever it wants to go. And it goes to people who appreciate it. But also sometimes. Many times also people who hate the content and they're just like, you know, 
this should not exist but uh, yeah and I think like I mean as difficult as it gets I think like that is also important and that is why we make what we make right so that people who are like us of course it's not working <laughs> it's working <laughs> okay uh, at least if it's not working baby please tell me yeah I'll just look at you so <laughs> it's also for people who may not think like us no, I'm I'm sure. Sure. I'll just hold it. Yeah. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. So we also make things not for people who are just like us, for people, but also for people who may not have access to all of these things. And then, like, you know, they only have, like, one way of thinking about things. And then, like, this presents them, like, a whole different idea of what mm, women are and how they feel and, you know, what uh, we have to say about certain legal frameworks and everything about women's health. And, yeah, so it's for everyone. And how do I go about, like, dispersing it? Mostly... It goes back, the reason that our publication, Sister Time, especially is multilingual, so it's like, it is English, but also Gujarati, Tamil, Hindi, Telugu, Marathi, Urdu. It's a mix of different languages, languages spoken in the communities that have held me in Bombay and, you know, enabled me to do my work that I do in Bombay. So the material goes to goes back to the community. Sometimes the women who come to the library take a bunch of works and uh, they are like, oh, I want to give this to, like, you know, women in my family, and that's how it goes everywhere. For people outside, it's mostly through word of mouth because um, I'm not very popular in the art scene and there are no collectors who have bought my works yet. Collectors, are you listening? Okay. <laughs> No, but I'm not popular, so it's, a, it's mostly through word of mouth. People talk about uh, it or have seen it. You probably had seen it somewhere, and then like you talk about it, and then it goes around everywhere. And the other way is that people who have waited for something like this to happen, like a lot of times people who come to Sister Library, because it is apparently like the first... Uh, community-run, community-owned, totally independent feminist library. And, you know, so people are excited to come to the space. We have had, like, pre-pandemic, we had people from Chhattisgarh who had saved up money to come to the library and spend a week in the library just, like, you know, looking at works and minding the space. We have had people from Argentina who traveled all the way. So it's also an exciting space, sort of, for people to come and then... Huh. So for people who are excited by this work, they're already excited, they take it around. They also kind of make uh, systems, I don't want to call it systems, what do I call it? Like something, like they organize. They organize to make sure that some form of sustenance goes on in the library. So we've also had like multiple fundraising, art bazaars, open mics, all sorts of things. Uh, done by like women and sisters all across the world. So we've had like something in Berlin, something in Toronto, something in Montreal. Um, where else? We've had like uh, events all across India. And sometimes these women have never even come to the library, but the fact that this space exists and you know, they get excited and that's how. <laughs> it's all organic, no plan. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit as well about um, some of the kinds of fly posting and posters, poster making that have taken place in, um, in Kathmandu, for instance, with the project there? Um, what are also some of the scenarios that, that perhaps um, are um, intimidating while sort of taking that, that kind of step in a city like Bombay as well? Yeah. Uh... I like to wheat paste because I also feel like we're bombarded by so many images that we've never consented to see. And then like with every image that we see, it kind of like restructures the way we think about things. And then like, you know, we are not treated like anything else, but just consumer of things, consumers of things. And so I was like, let me just take the, these spaces as well and like, you know, share what I feel. And the work that I did with Kathmandu Trinali came from a space actually of like a lot of pain because I get harassed in Bombay which is like 
the safest city in India, but like, you know, with if you are an indigenous woman and you look like a certain kind of indigenous woman, I look sort of very ambiguous also. So it's like I undergo a lot of threat and violence and I've gone through so much of it that I was like, hey, like I have to tell the world that like, you know, a woman was harassed here. And then like, it's not like it does not um, demand sympathy. It does not, like, it's not, it's just a statement that this happened here. And it's up to you to interpret how you want to interpret. And of course it was difficult because usually I'm working throughout the day with children and women in the library at the Raviat room doing Bombay underground things. So most of my work happens in the night and yeah, like a woman doing things at night, mostly by myself, sometimes at the Manchu, it is challenging. And I have been like stopped by police, chased by pimps, uh, yelled at by aunties, all sorts of things. And it is not just Bombay. I did like a wheat pasting thing in Venice where, <laughs> what's the thing, like the huge palace dojo, yeah, there. I. I wheat pasted a poster, which is just like an indigenous woman, which I'd also made for the posters unite. Uh, it's an indigenous woman, a Thangmi woman, actually. Um, Aya Thangmi, she's holding like her sickle, and then like I've kind of made like a halo around her head, and then it says Jal Jungle Zameen, which had like this uh, three things that are like, you know, our identity, but also our war cry. And so it just means like land, water, forest. And they call the cops on me. So I, cops have been called many, many times and I have to run away many, many times. And, <laughs> and sometimes I call China, I'm like, cops. And <laughs> yeah, so it's difficult. But sometimes it's also great because like the work that I showed that is in Peckham, a lot of people, it's on the way to the feminist library. There was a lot of like grief when, you know, bell hooks passed to the other end. And we were all like, uh, how do we hold this pain? And I was like, you know, she's given us so much. And then like, I made this big poster and then we went and then we, we pasted that. And many people who passed through that way to go to the feminist library, they, like, they would send me pictures of that work and like, you know, be, to be reminded of Bell Hook's work. So there's also love, but it's not always love. Yeah, we're open for questions. So. humbled by listening to the way you have confronted the things you faced, your experiences. You. Now, what I would like to know a little about is, you know, the fractured identities that you had to contend with. Um, and not just because you are from Darjeeling, that's one thing, the racial identity. But also, you know, three days, the Pakistan flag, and then the Indian state comes and then this uneasy relationship with the, not just the Indian state, I'm much more, you know, the state is something you can deal with, but it's the people, the mainstream community, and how you had to contend with all these, and are there any uh, memories of what your parents told you about the kind of treatment they may have um, had to face, not just from representatives of the state, but from mainstream society. Yeah. That is what I would like you to Yeah, well, every day is kind of like a problem where you have to like prove your identity that you are
Yeah, like if at all, if at all, they would, should have asked you to speak in Marathi, like what the hell. So, yeah, things like this happen all the time and not just with like, of course, I like I feel really like my anxiety is at an, at an all time high when I have to um, come to Bengal or like even have to work with another Bengali person because the unlearning hasn't happened and the acknowledgement. We have the tea, and we have tourism, and we've always had it, and the history of tea is really like terrible. So now every few years, like not even every few years, every day people demand separation from Bengal. But yeah, and yeah, lots of troubles, not just for me, but everyone else that comes from Darjeeling. There are new colonizers. Yeah. Yeah, course, it's the same, like, it's the same that the British did. I, I would say, no way, even worse. Um, and also, like, when it comes to Northeast as well, like, when... See, Nepali is not my language. It was enforced upon us by the caste Hindu kings. My language is Tangmikam, which is my language, my indigenous language. So I am not a Nepali person. This identity was enforced upon me. Okay, but when we talk about Gorkha land, the Gorkha identity is a very different identity. It's an imagination that people who were enslaved brought together. It is Gorkha does not mean like enslaved, like you know, mercenary soldiers. It has a very different like history to it and articulation to it, which nobody knows because people like me are not allowed spaces like this where we can talk about what it really is. And there's also a lot of shame in being Nepali because of all the trafficking that happens. Like if you go to Sonargachi, then you'll see like everyone speaking in Nepali. And you know, people from the Northeast also, like when I go to universities, there's always a conflict because like we eat the same food, we have sort of like similar cultures, but the, there is also a drift because they are called Nepali a lot of times, the rest of the people from the Northeast, which is seen as a slur and an attack. So when they actually witness another Nepali person or like a Gorkha person, they are just like, oh, hell no. So yeah, they have been forced uh, clearance, clearance of, of Gorkha communities from the Northeast in many different regions. It has a lot of history. Uh, you can, there are many books to look at and read. Okay. Sorry, long answers only. <laughs> There's a lot more um, th that I, I would love to ask you, I'm, I'm sure also from others in the room. Um, should we take one more? Is there one more question? Or should we wait for Q&A? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands, so I'm just going to, yeah? Okay. Okay, thank, thank you so much, you. and um, yeah. Are there any activists in Darjeeling right now who are kind of trying to uh, build up this resistance uh, and to uh, to build up this resistance against the state, uh, whether it's Bengal or whatever, um, and to regroup and assert uh, the. Uh, indigenous identity. Are there? Yes, there have always been attempts by people who maybe not do not even claim like activist status, but then like we have our elders and our clan leaders, despite the 
colonial tea plantation, like whatever, like forceful assimilation. We still have our spiritual practices and we go and like, you know, we still practice our ceremonies. But there is also a very forceful Hindu integration and, you know, this claiming of uh, indigenous peoples as Hindus because Oh, there's so much of, like, Arya history, like, you know, how Shiva was, like, supposedly a Kirati person, and anyway, but also there's been, like, Christianity, there has been Islam, there has been Buddhism, all of these religions have been, like, they have a very troubling history when we talk about indigenous communities, but yeah, we've always had, like, people who have held space for everyone, and I'm grateful for them because... Really, like I wouldn't be here if not for people who have great pride in who they are. This is just to touch on the example you gave about what your experience in the passport office and to tie it up to a question that was asked from here and what Andrew spoke that a lot of um, things get brushed by another culture um, when you encounter it, um, a behavior of somebody. And um, the term that I heard way back three decades ago in England, that it is cultural. It happened very innocently in, when I was working in the NHS, when the Indian doctors, there was a complaint about them that they were too familiar with the English patients. And, there was one cons English consultant who had, um, his parents grew up in India, so he was familiar with India. He, he used to visit India a lot. And in the committee that was formed to address this problem, he brought up the thing that it is cultural, they are unaware. Now, that may have been true at that, that particular case, but I see it over the decades, then become a refuge for a lot of people, saying it's cultural, excuse it. And it's usually a male person in a, in a position of authority. And I've come up against it in work, and so I know exactly what you're going through because you're going through many more layers than we as just women in the workplace are going through it. So in this case, when he's telling you it's friendly, I usually confront the person now and ask, define what you mean by friendly. Right. Because sometimes even I cannot ascertain whether it, there is an innocent thing or there isn't. And I'm sure we all know the lines clearly, but it's becoming, you know, and especially as the young in India are migrating around the country, and in your generation, far more than us, this encounter is becoming daily. We didn't have that much. We were still in the 70s and 80s when we grew up. We were still, even though Bombay was cosmopolitan and we had it, there was, it wasn't this kind of encounter. We all encountered it in school, but in terms of religion. What is the encounter now in the young in India is of ethnicity coming very clearly up and the questions are being asked. And I think that it's only dialogue, like you taking it up with others, asserting that, but then, and you know, it's a, it's, it's a very nice, um, I mean, it's like the Maratha Prize saying that no, but it's also the questioning of the Bihari superior officer telling you it's friendly. And I think we have to go back and say that what is a defined friendly? Right. You know, and it, it's something that um, even when he spoke about um, the question that came from you, I thought very, two very good questions is that if resources are uh, like, if the elders who they, um, somebody forgot to ask them to come, that's also etiquette. Why do you forget about, you wouldn't forget about a famous artist, a famous white artist to call them because you want them there. How do you forget that so late in a program that there is this funding for that? And the second question, if resources are tight, are you, who is taking the decision that we want the greater pull of this artist to come rather, rather than go through calling an elder from a minority, uh, from a um, uh, 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 indigenous community, where we have the incurrence of two more people to pay for. So these are still um, areas that I think are opening up now as the encounters become uh, more frequent and more apparent. And I you know I think people like you working in this space. I know Himanshu. I know what Arabi Art Room does, and uh, I think it's just to commend you for the stamina that 
all these years you'll have stayed there. My father had a clinic in Dharavi in the late 60s and 70s, so I know Dharavi from those days. And it's no longer that the slum it was when I was there. It's now a community. It's like almost a township. And, um, and there are several layers of um, still the slums in India, which are, which are in the Dharavi state now, but still exist in Bombay, which are far worse. Mm -hmm. But I just, for Dharavi Art Room, I just commend you on the stamina, because no, I, I haven't seen any other art initiative like this in those circumstances stayed through these decades. Thank you. Yeah, I think it would be great to also have maybe a bit more informal conversation. Um, it's been very emotional and um, yeah, let's just hang out for whoever wants. There's also lunch, uh, break, um, and there's, yeah, there's uh, the zines, etc. So yeah, thank you so much. There's lunch break.